Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the uh, Master of Public Health uh, Program Virtual uh, Information. I am Dr. Claudia Serna. I'm the director of the Master of Public Health. And then we have Dr. Blau, who is the chair of the Public Health Department. Dr. Blau, do you want to introduce yourself? You just did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you about yourself. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna share um, a PowerPoint presentation about the program. We're gonna go over. So the Master of Public Health program is inside the Dr. Kieran Sipate College of Osteopathic Medicine. So uh, why thinking about having a Master of Public Health? Because we really would like for you to be the leader in your community for a healthier future. Right now we're seeing that with this uh, COVID-19, um, we really need more health professionals out there to understand and see how important is public health to be able to help community members. So that's the reason why it's important to have a Master of Public Health. This um, Master of Public Health, you, you can have it or you can do it online or on site. We have both options. The program is fully accredited and um, this degree really prepares you to define, to critical access, to applying theories, concepts, principles of everything regarding to public health. And it's a great, it's great to have a degree before or after like uh, um, being a public health professional. For example, Dr. Blavo, he's a DO and then he has his master in public health. My background, I'm a dentist and I also have a master of public health. So really a Master of Public Health, it's, it can uh, help you and can uh, match with any of the health care professions that you, uh, that you will, are thinking of doing or if you, uh, or after you have one, then it's important to have, uh, if you would like to pursue one because really kind of complement each other. So we can have dentists with a Master of Public Health, we can have DOs with a Master of Public Health, we can have PAs, we can have, um, pharmacies with, uh, with, with a public health degree. So as I mentioned, you can have before you enter into a health professional or during you're doing your health professional degree or after uh, pursuing your health professional degree. The program consists of 42 credits uh, and then they are divided in 27 credits are the uh, core courses such as epidemiology, social behavioral, health planning, biostatistics, and we also have electives. Uh, there are different electives because we have a huge background. Uh, our faculty has um, a diverse background. So we have some electives in health education, grant writing, advice biostatistics, and we also offer some courses such as the community health project, special studies, and the uh, public health research. These courses are uh, kind of designed that if a student would like to pursue a specific project or have some research in mind, uh, they can do this, um, this project, this research, and also get credit for that, working with one of our faculties uh, in the program. So as I mentioned before, how you're gonna be able to learn and to, have, um, to be able to attend this Master of Public Health. Uh, it's flexible, we have online and on-site classes. You can have it as a full-time or a part-time. Full-time will take you approximately two years. Part-time will take you three years. Uh, you're going to be exposed to many different research and community projects. As I mentioned before, our uh, faculty uh, it's, has a lot of different backgrounds. So you're going to have, you can be involved in projects as mental health, genetics, or health, health disparities because of, of the background that as a program uh, we all have and bring to the, to the table. Where you can go with a public health degree, you can work uh, in the uh, you can work in the public arena. You can be uh, in the government and not uh, in not governmental agencies, uh, healthcare facilities. You can be an epidemiologist, an environmental health science, and public health officer. You also can go and work on the educational sector as a health educator, health communication specialist, community health worker, medical faculty administration. Uh, you can also be in the private uh, world, like in a corporate world, as a consultant, as a researcher. You can also, with this degree, be in the nonprofit uh, area. Uh, you can be a health policy and planning, 
director of program and services or medical and health services manager, or you can also have also pursue, for example, uh, your um, a doctoral degree as a DO, MD, DMD, DDS, PharmD, among others. So it can take you like, for example, after you finish your bachelor degree, then you want you want to take a master of public health, and after that, it will help you a lot when you want to pursue a higher degree. And I just want to share that uh, the Master of Public Health program at NSU, we were ranked number three in the United States in the Intelligent.com BETS online Master in Public Health degree programs. This was done in 2020, so we're very proud to know that our program was uh, ranked number three. And this is what everything that I have for just as an overall of the program based on the presentation. I also want to share, uh, um, let me see if I'm able to. Let me share stuff. I'm going to share our um, I would like to share our um, web page and I would like to go over our faculty. Um, we still have other um, so we have Dr. Nicole Cook, uh, she's the epidemiology uh, in our faculty. We have Dr. Grant. Um, he uh, is, his specialization is in genetics. We have Dr. Haller, um, he does all the um, policies and uh, management classes. We have Dr. Montoya, she does the behavioral class. Dr. Navarro, she does the integrated learning experience class. Dr. Alina Perez, uh, she does the legal and ethical class and as his background, she's, um, she's a lawyer. We have Dr. Stacy Pinnock. Um, she does a lot of classes regarding um, aging, um, aging with aging population. That's me, and I do a lot of classes regarding. I, I manage the public health field experience, and I also have taught before the health communication class, the health education class, and the health promotion and disease prevention class. Uh, if you're interested in the program, um, in the web page, you can go to admissions, and here are the admissions requirements um for the students and then we also have the admissions uh, procedures one of the most important aspects uh to have in consideration are the terms dates and application that's very important a lot of people always ask what are the deadlines where can i submit my application so uh, here we have them for summer fall and winter 2021 everything that we pass a semester we add the new information, so we have always the current information. Uh, what is the best time? So you know when the semester will start with the term end and then the application deadline. Um, we have sometimes students that they say, okay, I haven't graduated from my undergraduate degree yet. Uh, I'm going to graduate uh, in, um, for example, our Master of Public Health starts May 4th, and then I believe the undergraduates uh, finish a week early. And and they say, okay, um, I will. I, I would like to apply, but then um, how do I, how do I do if my uh, transcripts are not yet there because I still have to complete. So we, uh, you kind of start the process, and then when you have all the uh, all the information, then you submit it, and then we just complete your file. So um, these are some of the information that I would like to share. That I think is um, most of the students always ask that questions, but I would like to refer to Dr. Blau if you can give us some an overview of the program and other things that I didn't mention during my presentation. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Serna. I think you did a great job uh, giving them the scope and the direction uh, as to how to uh, navigate uh, information about our program. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Emilio Lorenzo for hosting us uh, in this particular endeavor. You know, uh, public health is probably more relevant today than ever before given that with the COVID-19 epidemic, or let's be more specific, pandemic, um, uh, it affects every one of us, directly or indirectly. I think that until now, people didn't really quite understand uh, what public health was all about because most of the work we do from day to day is prevention. So uh, I'm a physician, I'm a pediatrician, and I do a lot of intervention. 
in fact, at two o'clock this morning, I got a call from a mother with a kid who was having stomach pain and stuff like that. And I came up with some solutions, some diagnosis and treatment. That's intervention. In public health, we don't want you to have a pandemic. So we focus on uh, things that we could do to ensure that you're healthy. We focus on things such as vaccinations that we would give you to help, uh, you know, maintain what we call a herd immunity, which means that the whole population gets protected from a disease that might occur. And so when nothing happens, nobody knows that public health exists. Okay. And that's the problem with public health. You know, we are our own worst enemies, you know, because we do such a good job most of the time that people don't realize what we're doing. But thank goodness, not really thank goodness, because it's not that I want this virus to be there, but at least we have an opportunity for people to understand how relevant it is. Especially today, the public health crisis has impacted the economy. Okay, In public health is a multidisciplinary field, okay, which means that we deal with a lot of different things, uh, you know, at the same time. So this is why Dr. Cerner was pointing out to you how we have uh, faculty from various disciplines uh, coming together, all trained in public health, but also from other uh, disciplines. So we're very interprofessional in what we do in our program. But the unique thing about our program, and I've been involved with the program from its uh, onset, we started uh, this program in 1994, actually, and our first class was in 1995. We successfully gone through three accrediting, well, actually four accrediting cycles, because the first one was a pre-accreditation. And, and so we've, we've been recognized by the national accrediting body called the Council on Education for Public Health all these years as a program that meets a certain minimum standard of education. But at the same time, the reason we've been successful by training so many uh, people who are now working all over the world uh, successfully shows that we do more than just a minimum training in public health. What do I mean by that? Well, we have students, for example, one of our students works in the National Health Service System in England right now. He's at the forefront of addressing the COVID-19 issue. I have We have a couple of students in the Broward County Health Department, Epidemiology Department they are at the forefront of dealing with uh, the COVID-19 issue in Broward County, which, which is one of the epicenters for uh, the virus. We have uh, uh, graduates who are in Palm Beach County uh, Health Department, uh, who are leaders there, and they are addressing all this in forefront. So products of our uh, public health program are actually at the forefront of uh, this epidemic um, issue. So when we train you, we train you with understanding that you might be interested in working in different facets of public health. So we offer a generalist program, but that doesn't say everything because a generalist program is getting a foundation on public health in all its various areas, vis-a-vis -vis epidemiology, biostatistics, uh, health administration, environmental health, um, and um, uh, I think uh, behavioral health, you know, things to do with um, health behaviors and so on and so forth. So we cover a whole lot of spectrum in, in giving you that foundation, but we also allow you the opportunity, should you have an interest in a particular focal point to take electives in those areas. So if you said, you know, I'm beginning to like epidemiology, great. You can take some electives in epidemiology. You could even take some electives in another college that offers a unique epidemiology course that you wanted to take, of course, with approval from us. Uh, same thing uh, with the other areas. I've had students who are interested in management and have decided to take an elective or two in the business school in some specific management area to complement the public health principles or somebody who's interested in nutrition who took an, some additional courses in nutrition in the nutrition program in order to uh, you know sort of focus uh, their education in public health to their area of interest so we have a very flexible program albeit um, you know, under a proper public health scrutiny, which means that, you know, whatever extra uh, course you take should be within the scope of what you're trying to achieve as a public health professional. So it's been very, very good. We've graduated students. We have a lot of the different types of students we have. The program is we have traditional, what we call traditional public health students, which means an, an undergraduate student 
who decides to pursue public health in hope that they would work in the public health field. So we've had many of those who've done that. Uh, we also have uh, health professions division students, uh, pharmacists, dental, dental students, medical students, PA students, nursing students, and so on, who decided to complement their education with an education in public health. We call them concurrent degree students. So they're taking, pursuing that for one degree and doing the public health at the same time. We've also had uh, individuals who after their health profession field realize how important public health is. And so as residents or as physicians or dentists or lawyers or uh, school teachers or whatever, they come back and pursue a public health degree. We even have faculty. We have faculty in the dental school, in the pharmacy school, in the medical school, and so on, who decided to pursue our MPH degree as well. So, and we have students from other institutions. We have, we've got MD students from a medical school in like uh, Tennessee and some other places who've pursued it. We have international students. So our program is, is very diverse as well. So we have students from Africa, from India, uh, England, as I mentioned before, Colombia, all over who also pursue. So what, what's unique about this is it makes the learning environment truly enriched with people from different perspectives, both horizontally and vertically. Okay, so, so you're getting students from various backgrounds, but you're also getting students from different levels of experience. We have students who uh, come from even major health institutions like the CDC, FDA, you know, other health departments pursuing their MPH because they have the practical experience, but maybe they didn't have the academic degree to back uh, you know, the knowledge and of experience. All of that really provides a very enriched environment uh, for you to learn. Okay, our faculty are very student friendly. Uh, and I think that's the nature of the public health personality anyway. We're people persons, we're, we're trying to help the whole community, we're helpers. Okay, so, so by nature, we do that. But I also let you understand that while you do learn things didactically in the program, a lot of what we try to do is develop you in the form of critical thinking and planning, okay? Because in public health, you have to understand that we always, before we do anything, we have to assess the situation. So assessment is a very important thing. And there's many assessment tools that you get through biostatistics, epidemiology, and so on. And we'll teach you that. You re remember right now in the COVID, uh, COVID issue, uh, everybody's talking about testing, testing, testing. You'll hear issues very soon about surveillance, 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 you know, sampling so that they'll know where the epicenter is, where, where's the hotspots, all that kind of, this is all public health skills that any of you could do it. When I, when I listen to it, it's like deja vu for me. You know, I mean, I, I know exactly what they're talking about. Sometimes I realize they don't know what they're talking about when I listen to it on TV, you know, because they don't really understand the public health principles behind it. But either way, uh, these are the skills we, uh, we show you, and it's very exciting. And you'll learn to apply these skills all the time. My special field is in global health. So I actually am a CEO of an NGO, uh, International Health Initiatives, that does projects, about 30 projects in about 15 countries. My students run almost all my projects, okay? I have different students running uh, an issue, uh, issue of, uh, like in Rwanda, they're running children's cancer project in Rwanda. In Nepal, they're running postnatal care issues there. In, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, they're running issues on dengue. Uh, in Sierra Leone, they're running issues on uh, malaria. In Ghana, where I'm from originally, uh, we have lots of different projects that we do there in diabetes, malaria, hypertension, and so on and so forth. So we have students doing all of this and why do they do it? We give them opportunity for leadership. We teach them the principles and then they work collaboratively with other public health uh, professionals and, and medical professionals in those countries and they work together in establishing things. So what are we doing for COVID-19 right now? Right now we have a project called Corona Shield Project and I have students running that project and we've already, um, uh, one thing we're doing is health education, trying to educate people about the social distancing, you know, sanitation issues and so on. But we're also manufacturing masks right now in Texas, 
in, in Florida and in Ghana right now. And we, for example, I just got an email a few minutes ago that uh, the um, uh, sort of public uh, drivers, uh, you know, people, public transportation drivers in Broward County, we just distributed 50 masks to them. And, and they're very excited and appreciative of that. So what I'm saying is we teach our students real life things and we engage them in that, in all the different fields. And that includes research. I have many students who've presented many of us faculty have students who present all over the country pretty much every other month and that goes on in our program so it's very exciting i'll give you now an opportunity if you want to ask any questions uh, emilio i'll give you the mic in that yeah. perspective and we can go from there so that i can we uh, dr serna and i can answer specific questions that you might have at this point and i want to actually build on what you said dr Blau and dr serna i think um, the training and the guidance that you guys provide in your program is excellent. And what a better time, I know difficult time, but a great time to get involved in the public health field because although the economy is struggling, that's actually one of the industries where the opportunities are coming more and more. And I think that's something that's gonna be happening going forward is we're gonna see a lot more investment in public health areas and better way to getting in the strong master's program to set you up for a career in that. So I wanted to add that just working on the career side, I see some of the job and internship opportunities that are popping up. And that's one that we're seeing being very lucrative and more and more being opened up in a lot of different areas within public health. Absolutely. Um, so I know we have uh, uh, some students on the call. I wanted to open it up to you to see if you have any questions about uh, the master's in public health program at NSU, uh, questions for Dr. Bob and Dr. Serna to maybe answer or anything that we maybe touched upon today that you want to expand. Chica, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie do, you, do you guys have any questions to them? I had a question about how the admission process works or the application process to get into the program. Uh, Dr. Serna, would you explain it to them, please? You're muted. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Blau. Okay, so I was gonna share with you um, the um, the best way to get all the information is uh, through the Master of Public Health um, webpage. We have the admissions requirements here. Um, so you need to have your bachelor's. Also, um, we um, the student needs to have some of these. Um, so we list, these are like the official test scores. So you can have a GRE, PCA, uh, MCAT, DMT, G, uh, GMAT. So these are the kind of the um, the test scores that we uh, that we want that we require for students to have. We don't have a specific um, um, number because we see your application in a holistic approach. We see uh, your essay. We see your letter of recommendations. We see um, the points that you obtain in these um, in these exams. We see everything as a whole in order for uh, for us to make the decision, and then you need to have, um, uh, and then we have you have uh, okay. So if you are enrolling another program, you need to be in a good standing. If not, you just we just need to have a recommendation letter. So this is kind of the requirements. I'm just gonna pass through the uh, procedure so we have a better understanding here. So in the procedures, uh, you submit all your application electronically, and here is the information. Um, our application is $50, then you have to submit the transcript for all the uh, coursework that you have done it, and you have that, and then you submit that through, um, this is the, the email address. Um, you are not an international student, so you don't have to look for that. This is more for international students if they have completed anything outside. We need uh, the official scores, as I mentioned, for any of these um, tests. Uh, it needs to be uh, no more than five years. Uh, if you're an international student, you need to have proof of the TOEFL. If not, we don't require that. And we also require two letters of recommendation. So hopefully one for a health professional, another one for an individual older than a relative that can talk, that can tell us a little bit more about you. And these letters are important because we wanna know you uh, through the eyes of someone else that is gonna recommend you. So these are kind of the procedures and the, one of the things that are also important to know is like the applications are dates. Um, so depending on where you want to, um, what term you want to apply, so you have to take in consideration the application deadline. So these are the application deadline like for summer, ready pass, 
Uh, actually, we extended until uh, the 24th. We did, we did an extension for summer. For fall, uh, this is the application deadline, August 1st. And then for winter 21, 2021, we have December uh, 15th. Uh, do you have any questions that I, that I can answer regarding this application? Um, no, I think that's, that's about it. Uh, how many letters of recommendation do you suggest? Two. We, have, uh, we say that two letters of recommendation. Okay, and then for example, if I were to take the MCAT or the GRE, it wouldn't matter which one I applied with, right? Correct, no, it doesn't matter. We, we, uh, all of them are, um, we, any of them can work for, uh, for us. And I mentioned we see your, your uh, we're not only seeing, of course, we take in consideration your GPA of the scores, but also we see your file as, an, uh, as a very like holo, holistic approach. We see everything, we see the letter of recommendation, your essay and everything that you bring to the table uh, on your application. Dr. Blau, do you wanna add something to that? You're muting now, Dr. Blau. <laughs> I keep muting and I'm muting, so sometimes I forget. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, yeah, you said everything that's pertinent. Uh, the web address is www.nova.edu slash ph. So that's how you access our public health website. Um, but um, uh, yeah, you know, we look at the whole person and, and determine, um, you know, whether you you're prepared to take on uh, that, uh, you know, body of knowledge and uh, set of skills. But I noticed that also Chica has written something. She says, I know you talked about the diverse student body and the ability to choose specific electives, but what makes NOVA MPH program different, different or better than other schools? Oh, I think that there are excellent uh, public health programs all over the country. I am a, a national accreditation inspector. I've been that for about 20 years. So I go all over the country and inspect other programs. But I can tell you one reason they select me, and, and that's an invited position. I'm, they select me to be an, because they know that I come from a program that is quite representative, that's well respected, okay? So I wouldn't be sent out to inspect University of Cincinnati or University of Tennessee or University of Texas in El Paso and so on program if they didn't think that I knew what a good program is like, okay? So that in itself is an evidence to you uh, you know, the work we do here. Uh, but uh, we're unique in many, many, many ways. First of all, we are resided in Nova Southeastern University. Uh, Nova is, is such an amazing institution. You have no idea. It's just one of those, I don't know why it's a secret, you know, because everybody should know. I've been teaching at Nova for 31 years. I've taught in the medical school, taught in the public health program. I have earned a lot of recognition for my work in all of these places. Uh, so it's not like I've been passive. I've been very, very actively involved. And I can tell you that I serve on a lot of uh, community agencies on their, on their boards and, and on state agencies and on some national agencies and so on. And whenever I represent NOVA there, uh, I'm amazed how many people tell me, oh, I know about Nova Southeast University. You got some good people there, don't you? And I said, but of course, I'm glad that you do because I, sometimes I don't hear people realize that, you know, they talk about Harvard and Johns Hopkins and everything. Look, we have a program that is as good as any of those programs. And another example, and Dr. Um, Cerna is my witness. We just were invited uh, only a couple, a few weeks ago by the Council on Education for Public Health to give an example, show them, uh, take one of our examples of what we do to show to the rest of the country of the other, other schools and uh, programs in public health. But which section was it, Dr. Uh, Serna, did they ask us to, to share? The, the behavioral part of, with Dr. Montoya. But yeah, but it was on interprofessional education, I think, yeah, was correct. it? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the quality of work we're doing is rec recognized nationally and certainly internationally with our uh, involvement with international health initiatives. So, so you wanna know how different uh, we are? These are elements that demonstrate our difference. But to me, the biggest difference is our products. We, as I've told you, we have graduates in positions throughout the world. And, and you know, we have graduates working for the CDC. We have graduates working for the FDA, uh, for many health departments around the country, all the way to California. And then we have lots of doctors and PAs that we've trained. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of them who are leaders in their professions because of the added 
value added public health education that they've got from us. And we're very proud of that. I hope that's helpful information for you, Shika. And I wanna add that one of the things that I'm very proud is our diversity. So we have people from Cuba, so professors from Cuba, Nicaragua, San Croix, Ghana, Nigeria, Colombia, Canada, and Jamaica. That background really brings a lot of good information, great research, great community projects to the program. I think I'm very proud of that diversity that we have in the faculty. In the and, and USA as well, by the way. I say USA. <laughs> <laughs> people for us, I will say for all over the world. Yes, indeed. Program. Yeah, we are a very global program. We really are. And I just want to add it to Estefania regarding uh, the admissions. So I was just saying, for example, if you are in the undergraduate program, if you want, for example, if you are finishing uh, during the summertime, um, right now in May, and then if you want to apply to the summer MPH program, you can apply and send all the information. The only thing that it will be missing in one case will be your final transcripts because you haven't finished your program. So actually we, uh, we address you, we take everything, and then when you have um, when we receive your final, your final transcript, then you're going to be able to take classes. But the transition is very easy for you to do it uh, in a way that if we have everything ahead of time and we're just waiting for that final transcripts, uh, in one week you will be able to just start the program. So I know because um, some of the students were kind of telling me, I am just graduating and then if I want to start like the semester that the master that I start the next week, how we can do it. So yes, we can. Um, but we just have to have everything before ahead of time and then we just have to wait for the uh, official transcript when you already finish all the classes in your uh, in your undergraduate program. So well, she, 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 all right, sorry. So Shika was asking about the uh, class size. Actually, that's one of the unique things at Nova Southeast University. Um, in our public health program, uh, we have very small classes, you know, uh, for the most part, about 20 within a class. In some of the on-site, a few of the core on-site classes, it may go up to around 30 or a little bit beyond that. But our classes are small. But it's beyond being small. We, the, our faculty, interact very closely with the students very, very much. Uh, we, we really interact with them. I have, um, I'm teaching a course on vaccine and vaccine preventable diseases this semester. Right? We're, it's pretty much done now. One of my students was in Spain. She was uh, basically because of COVID-19 uh, quarantine essentially throughout the time. You know, I kept calling her all the time to try to see that she's safe and she's well and, and, and you know, guided her through the course. Now she tells me she wants to become a physician like me. So now she, I'm going to be her mentor. <laughs> I just am waiting for her to get out of the quarantine. Uh, but we do really develop a relationship. I have students whose families have adopted me just because I mentored their children. So I get calls from Nepal, from India. And Dr. Serna knows that, you know, from families just to check on me, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is so touching, you know. Uh, but the relationship that we build in this program is incredible. And that's because we have small class sizes such that we get to know the students and really develop a professional relationship with them for the rest of our lives, essentially. Estefania, I know you, uh, you have a question? Um, actually, he kind of just answered it. I was wondering how many people you guys usually take, um, like for every semester. Uh, you want me to answer that? And there, we don't, we you know, we sort of budget a certain scope of uh, students, but uh, generally uh, we, you know, it, it varies uh, from semester to semester, you know, in itself. At any one time, we have anywhere from 200 to 250 students attending classes in the program. But within each class, you know, then you have that level of about 20 or, you know, a few more you know, when it's uh, an on-site uh, class. But we have some that are even smaller, like it'll be 10 students at times, depending on if it's an elective, for example, where, you know, where we can focus. Like when I teach global health, a lot of times I, I usually have about uh, 10, 10 students or so. And we have a terrific time because each of them really develop uh, applicable programs uh, for wherever they, they come from. And even if it's America, if it's Tennessee, as it will, I study their issues in Tennessee, pick one of them, and let's come up with a strategic plan on how you're going to solve that problem and so on and so forth. So we, we really do a lot of experiential learning, um, you know, and, and engage the students uh, very much. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Yeah, and because of the background that we have, we're really kind of trying to kind of understand and know our students. And for example, I have a students that are in the dental field, would like to be a dentist. So I, my background is dentistry. So I'm involved in my projects. I guide them. So because of the diversity, not only of the background, because of our ethnicities, but also background different. We have dentists, lawyers, physicians, people, uh, genetics. So there's, we have a lot of backgrounds that will help uh, with the different areas where students would like to, to, to pursue. And we're very friendly. We're here for the students. The students can contact us all the time. We're via Zoom, email. Our doors are always open. So we're very well known for uh, that connection that we have with the students. Yeah, there's no students who've graduated from our program in the last, since 1995 who didn't have my cell phone number, okay? We, we directly interact with you. Um, Chica is asking a question uh, whether the online is different from the on-site. Um, actually, it's identical uh, except for the modality that we use to teach. I was one of those that years ago, I was resistant to starting the online because I thought, you know, it'll distance us from the students, but it hasn't been at all because of tools like the Zoom and so on, because we are both synchronous and asynchronous. So in our online program, it's not a certificate program. You don't just get assignments and then go and do whatever you want to. It's like classes, just like the on-site, uh, except that uh, you know we divide some of the work to a smaller amount of hours for chat time, which is when you do a lot of interactive uh, work and you talk, you have discussions with your classmates and so on and so forth. But we also have asynchronous things where you can have discussions asynchronously, which means you go in whenever you, you want to, and then you do certain assignments that are then further discussed the next week when you meet. So our uh, the other interesting thing is that they're similar, basically the same courses. So for the core courses, we teach them both online and on-site. And most of the time, is taught by the same person. So if Dr. Cook was teaching epidemiology on-site, she teaches epidemiology online. The syllabus is exactly the same. So the only difference is the modality that we use. And we have the same interactions with the online or on-site students. So we're always giving uh, the same interaction to both of them. And uh, Shika is asking, how many classes are students usually taking each semester? Well, Shika, uh, that just builds on what Dr. Cerner told you. It varies according to the student. We have uh, full-time and part-time students and the whole spectrum of it. Officially, we allow you up to five years to complete this program. So you have students who complete the program a little over a year, you know, for the most part, two years. Then you have, you have some that finish it in two years, three years, four years, and even five years. The ones who com uh, completed in four years like um, people like medical students who are taking it concurrently so they don't have a lot of time to dedicate to the public health so they may take one or two classes each semester uh, the traditional public health students might take three classes each semester uh, you know those who want to finish it within two years um, uh, but it really varies a lot and then there are some students who will take more one particular semester and fewer other semesters depending on what they're doing in their lives because excuse me, because some of them are professionals, you know, who work in some of these places and there may be certain semesters where the, you know, the, their workplace is a lot more demanding and then others that is maybe lighter and then they'll, they'll uh, you know, put in more. So, so there's, there's a lot of flexibility in what you do. We just give you some guidance as to how to plan it so that the, the ultimate educational experience is meaningful. You know, so one thing builds on the other. All right, can you, I, I want to see the chat. I'm just sharing right now here, we have in the web page a sample for the, uh, as a full time, what are the, uh, some of the options that we give you, and then as a part time. And then also uh, in our web page, uh, you're able to see uh, all our classes. So you're able to see um, the core courses and also all the electives that, uh, that, we, um, that we offer. So I just want you to make yes. aware that we have all that information in the web page. And as I mentioned, there are other opportunities to take electives in other programs to complement your education. So, so we really do uh, give you enough flexibility to tailor your education to your needs. And then Estefania asks, would you recommend this master's program before I start medical school or at the same time? Well, Estefania, it's entirely up to you because you, you know your circumstances better, <clears throat> okay? Um, but as I said, there are people who pursue it uh, during their quote-unquote gap year, gap period, and then there are others who 
uh, if they come to NSU, they have the opportunity of doing it concurrently. So they do it, it's not a combined degree. So you still two separate degrees, you know, but uh, they do it concurrently. And then there's some that do it after, but it really depends on, on you. If certainly you have an opportunity to pursue it before medical school, it probably is a good time to do that. But nevertheless, uh, if you're entering medical school uh, right away, that's an opportunity. We even have other students in other medical schools who, come, who pursue our MPH concurrently. Not many, but there's a few that do that. So. Just if you want to kind of bump up a little bit your application for going to medical school, having a master of public health program really help you because you can talk about all the interactions, the community work, the research that you have done, and uh, that will help you also in your application if you want to go med to medical school. Yeah, that was my idea originally. I was thinking of maybe taking a gap year and pursuing this master's program before I would start medical school because I find it very interesting. And like you mentioned, it would also help me get into medical school. Well, I, let me how long it take. Well, let me explain to you a little bit, Estefania, because I am an assistant dean in the medical school myself right now, and and I tell you that the uh, public health degree itself doesn't quote unquote get you into medical school, yeah. but it complements your work because to get into medical school, obviously you have to have performed well on your MCAT, and you have to have a good grade point average, and you have to. Uh, certainly show interest, show that you really are interested in pursuing that, uh, you know, field. So public health will contribute to your, uh, to the evidence that you are certainly interested in the field and you can show examples of work you've done maybe through some of the research you've done and so on and so forth. But honestly, if you're trying to get into medical school, uh, the, it's the performance that you have in your basic sciences and your performance in the MCAT that really matter the most. But public health would certainly complement um, all of that. All right. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. How much emphasis do you think they put on research just because you know? Who? Um, like going into medical school, like doing research with public health, like. Oh, you know, it's not, it's not an emphasis, it's a compliment, okay? Uh, because as, like I said, you see, when we are accepting people into medical school, we, are, we, we want to accept people who we feel will succeed because it's a quite a strenuous uh, process, you know, four years to, you know, going to residencies and so on. So we, we're, we're looking out for the student really in finding who would best succeed. And the only, the way you can demonstrate that you would succeed in medical school academically, that is, would be your um, uh, performance in the MCAT and your GPA in terms of the courses that, that you know, like in the bi biology, uh, you know, micro, I mean, uh, biochemistry, uh, you know, anatomy, physiology, you know, whatever, those kind of courses. If you've already demonstrated that you're capable of performing well in those courses, then that gives us a peace of mind that when you do them in a more advanced and rushed uh, albeit is rushed because it's a lot of stuff in a short period of time that you will be successful. So those are the things we look at actually. Uh, but if you've had some experience in, in, in research, if you've done some shadowing, if you've uh, worked as um, a scribe, uh, if you've maybe done paramedic, all these type of things certainly all complement. If you've done some research, it tells us that you've had the opportunity to do some critical thinking and so on. All of that complement. You see, so what happens is there's so many of you that come in there who've done well in your MCAT and done well in your GPA. So now what sorts you out? That's when the person who, you know, has met the basics well, but also has uh, experiences like in public health and so on, then they beat, beat out the, the others. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nima, we gone Nima? <laughs> are we going over? Okay. No, no, I think we're on perfect time. Oh, but okay. I think we've gone over so many great things that I, mm -hmm. Chica and Estefania for your questions. I think there's are very common questions other students have about the program and um, kind of next step graduation. Um, but a special thanks to Dr. Blava and Dr. Cerna taking time out of their day uh, talking about this amazing program, career opportunities available with the program, uh, ways to get your foot in the door. And as we mentioned, a public health is a very lucrative uh, career to get into and 
what a great program to have at NSU to be able to get your foot in the door and be able to dominate the career that you're getting into. Yes, we're very proud of our students and, and certainly uh, appreciative of the privilege that we have to empower them to serve uh, the world. Perfect. I will just say that sometimes uh, there's a lot of information and then we just got, uh, so if they have any questions afterward, all of our information is also in the web page. So please do not hesitate to send us an email and asking us more questions. Sometimes when you receive a lot of information, you forget to ask crucial questions. So please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we're here to help you and we're here to guide you in any way that we can. Perfect. And this webinar is gonna be available on our YouTube page and our next newsletter. Um, so we'll be spreading the word and getting that information out there. Dr. Serna, Dr. Pavel, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Well, Stephanie, did you have a question? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, perfect. Pleasure. Thank you both for taking the time today and sharing the insight on the program. We really appreciate it. I know how much students are going to get from this. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio, for the privilege. Yeah, thank you. It's great to know that yeah, it was very informative as uh, Chica said. That's great. And if any questions arise later after, please don't hesitate to contact us.